I'm going to hit record. There we go. Now we're recording. And yeah, this is good because we all, whether we own investment properties or our clients own investment properties, this is always a subject. Even me, I, and I would consider myself, I don't want to say expert, but somewhat as an experienced investor, I still get lots of questions and everything. And we always turn to great professionals like Beta. So thank you so much for being here. And I'm excited to learn alongside everyone else today. And I'm going to hand it right over to you, my friend. Excellent. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, I'm very excited to be here. It's my first presentation, first of many with you guys. So I'm glad to be here. Thank you for making the time and thank you for coming on. You're going to learn. There's going to be an overwhelming amount of information. And I'm going to send actually a copy of all these slides to Gary. I have a cheat sheet that I'm going to send to Gary as well. I'm going to overwhelm you a little bit, Gary. And then you can send it off to everyone. And then you guys can always uh, refer back to it uh, if you have any questions. So uh, if you have, for those of you who don't know me, I, I recommend that you head over to our social media, like us, follow us on Facebook and Instagram. I always tend to give my materials away and always keep you updated with what's going on in the realm of landlord and tenancy matters. Uh, I'm very responsive. If you ever have a question that you require clarity on, email is the best way to get a hold of me and our email is right there. So let's get started. I'll tell you a little bit about myself. My path actually started in real estate. So I'm like you guys, exactly the same with a license to practice law. Uh, I obtained my real estate license back in 2004, 2005. I don't sell anymore because obviously my firm keeps me really busy, but uh, that's how I got started. I started acquiring landlord and investor clients who actually purchased small to medium sized apartment buildings and commercial plazas, but they weren't here to tend to the day to day operations. So they resided out of province or out of country. So alongside my husband, Rob, we started a property management company to act as a blanket in providing management services for our clients. Again, just like all realtors out there, we want to keep that relationship going and we act as property managers. And then what I found that uh, I was going to the landlord and tenant board to, you know, represent my clients on, you know, matters pertaining to non-payment of rent, illegal activities. And nine times out of 10, my matters were getting dismissed because I was not a licensed paralegal or lawyer. And it was right then that I found that the board is not very realtor friendly or property manager friendly. So because I love school so much, I went back to school, I obtained my paralegal license, and now I provide legal support to brokerages and realtors like you guys and like Keller Williams in order to assist your clients when you guys, you know, have to deal with landlord and tenancy uh, matters with respect to buying and selling. So today we're going to talk about uh, how to successfully list, close, list the sell and close a property during COVID, more specifically the N12 and cash for keys, which is a popular thing that's happening right now. For the purpose of this presentation, everything we discuss is for general information only. Uh, I have to say this because we are recording. And if you have any questions, I ask you that you save them to the very end and then me and Gary, can we can do a Q&A. If you have a private matter, reach out to me. Email is the best way to get a hold of me and I'll provide clarity. Um, so let's get started. Uh, very common asked questions that I get asked are the top three that I've listed here from my realtors. So number one, and they're not very happy when they call me with these questions, I tell you. Number one, they call me and they say, Vita, can we evict a tenant to sell a property? Or the tenant isn't allowing for showings. Can we kick them out? Or the landlord's lease is coming to an end. Can we give the tenant notice to move out? And the answer to all these three questions is no, a hard no. No, we can't evict a tenant to sell a property. No, you can't kick a tenant out because they're not allowing for showings. And no, you can't give a tenant notice to move out because their lease is coming to an end. The reason why the answer is no is because tenants have what we call security of tenure. And what that means is that just because their lease is coming to an end doesn't mean that they have to move out. 
It means that that fixed term tenancy has now changed into a month to month tenancy. They're allowed to continue their the occupancy of the rental property after the lease expires. You see, a tenancy can only be terminated in one of three ways. Number one, if the tenant decides to leave and give no, gives notice, this is by way of an N9. Number two, if the landlord and tenant mutually agree to end the tenancy, that's by way of an N11. We're gonna discuss the N11 today. Uh, or the way you can look at the uh, mutual agreement to end the tenancy, it's like a mutual release, right? A mutual release uh, relieves, you know, relieves all parties from their contractual obligations to the agreement of purchase and sale. Well, the N11 is no different, okay? The, the thing is it releases all parties from their obligations to the lease. And number three, by way of a court or board order. So again, none of these ways is because you're angry, you wanna get rid of the tenant. It doesn't work that way. Or you wanna sell and you wanna get rid of the tenant. Let's talk about vacant possession. Let's start talking about vacant possession because when you're selling a property, the question always is, is how do you provide vacant possession? Is there a guarantee to vacant possession? So off the bat, there is no such guarantee to vacant possession. There's no guarantees in life except for death and taxes, right? So vacant possession is on that list. You cannot guarantee vacant possession. So let me direct your attention more specifically to clause number two on the first page of the agreement of purchase and sale. Because I know that 99% of everyone here has never read the agreement of purchase and sale. I know that for a fact because when I was a realtor, I never read the agreement of purchase and sale. I didn't need to, okay? But as a legal rep, I want you to know that the clause number two, the closing date clause, the last sentence says, upon completion, vacant possession of the property shall be given to the buyer unless otherwise provided for in this agreement. So the vacant possession clause is already innately built into the agreement of purchase and sale. So the agreement of purchase and sale is kind of like saying, yeah, buyer, we are guaranteeing you vacant possession. Although vacant possession is not a guarantee when a property is tenanted. The reason why vacant possession is not a guarantee when a property is tenanted is because the tenancy has nothing to do with the sale of the property. It's not, those two are two totally separate things. Again, what I want you to keep in mind is that the seller cannot pursue damages for an interference of the sale by the tenant, because again, the tenancy is not relevant to the sale of the property. You can't just kick a tenant out because the landlord wants to sell the property. If uh, on a schedule A, uh, there's a clause in there that says the buyer to assume the existing tenancy, then nothing needs to be done. The question is, if a buyer wants to move in, how do you go about that? That's exactly what we're going to talk about today. And anytime a realtor calls me or they try to challenge me, one thing I love about realtors is you guys are very challenging and you throw challenges at me. And I always want to educate you. This is my job to educate you. It's not about proving anyone wrong. It's about how do we get the matter resolved the right way so that the realtor is not liable. Keller Williams is not liable. Gary is not liable. We want to make sure that transaction flows smoothly. So anytime a realtor calls me and says, you know, we're selling a property, what are our options? There's two options, okay? So option number one is the landlord or their legal rep, not the realtor. Guys, stay away from serving any legal notice, more specifically the N12. The landlord or their legal rep will serve the N12 for the purchaser's own use. The N12, this is a screenshot of the N12. The screenshot on the left is a, the first page. The screenshot on the right is a second page. Now you're probably looking at this and saying, any dummy can fill, fill out this notice. I mean, how hard is it? You know, fill in what the box is asking you. Well, the reason why I want you guys to stay away from these notices is that you don't know what the consequences or requirements are in serving these documents, okay? This is why, again, I, I, I'm leading up to a story, more particularly that we had to step in and assist with a closing with a Keller Williams. Actually, the agent is, I, I hope she's on this call, on this uh, Zoom, uh, but we're going we're gonna to tell 
bits and pieces of that story because that is very important for you to keep in mind. Let's talk about the N12. When is an N12 served? The N12 can only be served in one of two ways, okay? So number one, if the landlord requires the property for their own use, the use of their child or their parent or their uh, caregiver for personal occupation for at least one year. Residential occupancy, not live in one uh, bedroom, sleep in one bedroom and operate the other one as your, as your home office. It has to be for residential occupation. For the purpose of this presentation, we're going to be referring back to the N12 for the purchaser's own use, okay? So the N12 can be served by the landlord or the legal representative upon a firm agreement of purchase and sale, not a conditional one. You can't serve because a conditional sale is not a guaranteed sale. I mean, a firm sale is not a guaranteed sale anyways either, but a firm sale means it, it provides one step further to stability than a conditional sale does. So again, the N12 can be served upon a firm agreement of purchase and sale. Number two, the property must contain three units or less. So if it's a fourplex, fiveplex, sixplex, sevenplex, you, the former seller landlord cannot serve the N12. This is a consequence. This is really important that you know or for members of the purchaser's immediate family member, caregiver, child, parent for residential occupation for at least one year, okay? Here's a consequence. An N12 cannot be issued and served if the landlord is a corporation. This is very, very important. If a landlord is, cor is a corporation, a corporation is a separate legal entity. How can a separate legal entity live and personally occupy a property? They can't. So again, personal occupation, not a corporation. An N12 can also not be issued for members of an extended family, brother, sister, aunt, uncle, cousin, niece, nephew. Uh, again, it has to be immediate family. This is why I don't want you guys entangled with serving the N12. Good faith requirement of the N12 is really, really important. So let's talk about good faith. Good faith is having the genuine intent to occupy the rental unit or property, rental property, for residential purposes. So an N12 cannot be served or used as a loophole in order to end the tenancy because the landlord is experiencing issues with the tenant. If the tenant is not returning text messages, if the tenant has blocked you on Facebook or blocked you from emailing, it cannot be used as a way to get rid of the tenant because the consequences are extremely high. And the reason, and one of the consequences are that a tenant can file a T5 bad faith application against a former landlord within 12 months from the date that they moved out. Remember, this is not a, an agreement or this is not an application that a tenant can only bring forward 30 days after they moved out. They have 12 months. And is it fair to say that during the 12 months, they have enough time to, you know, mingle on a party or call the landlord and tenant board and obtain more information? This is very important, guys. Please do not get involved with serving N12s. I have to apologize. Our office is a little open concept, and I have Rob here, uh, my husband and partner, answering the phone. So he's Italian, and you're going to hear <laughs> him speaking loudly. So I apologize for that. Uh, let's talk about service of documents, because one of the questions I'm going to be guaranteed to be asked at the end of the presentation is, can we serve a notice via email or text messages? So I have to start off by saying that I love the real estate industry because you guys have really evolved with technology. You're using phones in order to, you know, take a picture, scan and serve documents, sign via e-signature or docu DocuSign apps. Like, it's great. When I first entered the real estate game, we used fax machines. Okay, I'm going to date myself a little bit, as Gary probably knows too. We used fax machines. Now, the wheels of justice spin very, very slowly. And what that means is that landlords must serve their tenants in accordance to the rules of procedure of the landlord and tenant board. And that means Means that landlords may serve their tenants in one of the following ways. Number one, by handing the document to the tenant. Number two, handing it to another adult in the rental unit. 
Number three, mm -hmm. placing it yeah. in the tenant's mailbox or where mail is usually delivered. Just Number four, sliding the document under the door or through a mail slot. Number five, faxing it to their place of business or residence. Number six, courier, registered mail, or express post. Okay, so email and text messages are not on that list. Do not uh, use that. I know that the Ontario Standard Lease has a section where parties can agree that notices can be served via email. However, and I'll send the copy of the PDF uh, notice from the Landlord and Tenant Board uh, that allows email as you know, gives consent for email for service of notices. I would just attach this as a schedule to the Ontario standard lease so that in the event notices need to be served via email, you have the appropriate document signed. So again, here's another consequence. If you're serving any legal notice by mail, additional days must be added to the date of termination. This is why I don't want you guys involved in serving notices. Let's talk about the test of bad faith, because sometimes landlords or realtors ask me, well, how, how will the tenant know? Well, I'll tell you, the, the board has a test of bad faith. And I'll tell you the story because I had a client who resided in, she lived in Nigeria, and her daughter attended the University of Ottawa. And the, the, my client who resided in Nigeria owned a two-bedroom condo in downtown Toronto. And her daughter called her one day and said, Mom, I want to move to downtown Toronto. I want to experience having uh, independence, uh, living in the condo, basically living on my own. So the mother, in good faith, she served the N12 to her tenants. The tenants moved out. The tenants actually, one of them was a very um, savvy lawyer, and they had set up a Google alert. And for those of you who know what a Google alert is, is that it, it, it's like a series of keywords that can be entered into, I guess, a, a, a system. And any advertisement that matches these keywords will, will notify you once this advertisement is put onto the net. It's called a Google alert. You may want to look, look at it. It's very, and this is what we use as well to uh, catch bad faith, uh, uh, bad faith dealings. So you, want to, you may want to be aware of that. That tenant actually found an advertisement because unfortunately our client's daughter was not able to move into the rental unit. She got an acceptance letter from the University of Oxford in the UK and decided to pursue her education. So unfortunately, uh, the, her path took an unex unexpected turn and she decided to move to the UK. However, this is the test of bad faith because when we went to the, the, the hearing, the adjudicator asked me, Miss Delisi, did the tenant rely on the N12 in order to move out of the property? So we said, yes, the tenant actually moved out because they relied on the notice. Number two, is there an advertisement of the rental property? As you guys know, once you broker load a property onto the MLS, it hits certain public websites. So, you know, my client has contacted a, 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 an agent here and they put the property for lease on the MLS and that Google alert actually alerted the tenant. So now they have evidence of the advertisement. And number three, did the person who was supposed to move into the unit actually move in? And unfortunately, the answer to that question was no, the daughter who was supposed to move in did not move in. Total test of bad faith, uh, and she failed miserably on this. And, and again, these bad faith applications, 99% of the time are very, very difficult to defend. Because again, if you have an advertisement, how are you going to defend the intention or the good faith intention of the landlord? As unfortunate as this incident was, the tenant relied on this notice and the board ordered uh, the $14,000 uh, application that was against my landlord to be paid to the tenant. So here are the remedies that the board can order on a T5 bad faith application to the tenant. So the board can order a rent abatement, the difference in rent between the former unit and the new unit times 12 months in order to pay a fine to the board, moving costs, any out-of-pocket expenses that the tenant has incurred, 
up to $50,000. So it was 35,000. Now Bill, Bill 184, which came into effect in yeah. July of 2020, has increased yeah. that fine to up to $50,000. And any and other order that the, buy, that the board finds appropriate. So again, don't get involved. We don't want we don't want you guys to be listed on uh, the notice of hearing, uh, as as more and more of these bad faith applications are being uh, are, are are finding themselves on my desk. I'm also noticing the agents, both the listing agent and the cooperating agent, being listed as a party. And I want you to keep in mind that realtors are your insurance doesn't cover you so any fine that the board orders that a realtor pay you're paying for it out of pocket so stay away from this let's talk about the compensation okay because the n12 has a compensation requirement and per section 48 of the act compensation in the amount of one month's rent must be paid on or before the termination date whether or not that tenant moves out and we're going to talk about whether or not the tenant moves out. A declaration or affidavit must be submitted to the board. This I always did in my practice, but now the Bill 184, the new Bill 184, uh, states that landlords must disclose in a declaration or an affidavit of any previous notices of termination served to the tenant. Now it's going to be full disclosure because what, what we find is going on is that tenants are being served these N12s that are, are full of errors, whether it's being served by the, the landlord or their realtor. And then when they, you know, when they issue multiple N12s and the tenant doesn't move and then the landlord, you know, retains a legal rep who issues a correct N12, this poses confusion because of all the multiple different termination dates. So remember, you've got to do it right. No, Have your work. landlord or their legal rep issue this. Don't get involved in service of these notices. So I had asked, I, I, had, I had let you guys know that compensation must be paid on or before the termination date, whether or not that tenant leaves. So you're probably thinking, well, why wouldn't that tenant leave? And one thing I love about my agents when they call me is yeah, you guys like to challenge me, which I'm always up for a challenge. And it's not about proving one another wrong. It's about educating you so that you understand the process and procedure so that when you guys are out there selling, you know how to correctly advise your clients. Okay. So I always say to my realtors, have you read the N12? And 99% of the time they say, no, I haven't read the N12. Then I say, well, let me let me point you to the second page of the N12. So the second page of the N12, and this is the screenshot, the third bolded box from the left down, it's, it, it's saying to the tenant, what if you disagree with this notice? And to the right, it says, you do not have to move out if you disagree with what the landlord ha has put in this notice. If the tenant wishes to dispute the N12, they're not obligated to move out. I want you to keep that in mind because the sale of the property has nothing to do with the tenancy. The tenant doesn't have to jump every time the landlord says, I'm selling, get out. It doesn't work that way. There are now rules to protect tenants. However, if a tenant decides to leave earlier than the termination date, which is a great problem to have, then the landlord must provide a refund of all the monies held in their possession, as well as provide one month's rent compensation. Let's talk about the hearing because when the N12 is served, it needs to be filed because it's not good enough that it's just served. If it's just served, it's just a notice. It doesn't have any weight behind it. It doesn't have enforcement behind it. A certificate of service must also be filed with the board as proof of proper service. The landlord or the legal rep must also provide documentation to support the N12, being an agreement of purchase and sale, a doctor's note if a caregiver is required, affidavits, declarations, any other documents requested by the board. So how do we how do we cancel an N12? This slide is really important because I had a landlord call me again, not a few, yeah, I would say a few days ago and said, I issued an N12 because my tenant, uh, I wasn't getting along with my tenant. I just wanted them out. And how do I cancel it? Because now I've I've cooled down. And I said, well, Mr. Landlord, there is no set way to cancel an N12 once it's served. You can't redact an offer, not an offer, a notice 
when you serve a notice of termination. This is why it's very important that landlords make certain that who, whomever is moving into the property, their parent, their child, their caregiver, is a thousand percent committed before serving the N12. The N12. Because you know, excuses like the person changes their mind or their path took an unexpected turn, none of this flies with the board. None of it, zero, zip. It is too late to cancel the second the N12 is served. Now, if a tenant has committed to another lease and you, you have to cancel the N12, obviously you would have to inform the tenant in writing, compensation still has to be paid, and you're basically doing one of these and hoping that that tenant doesn't bring forward a bad faith application against you because you're opening yourself to liability. Let's talk about errors because all legal notices must be free from errors, no matter how minor. This is very important because any error in an application, whether it's a name, whether it's a date, whether you, you, know, you, you put day, month, year instead of month, day, year, these are really important. These, are, these details will get your matter dismissed. This is one guarantee, okay? One guarantee I can make. Any minor detail will get your application dismissed. And this is why I don't want you guys involved because you're not, although you, know, you, you come from a, the intentions are good that you wanna help your clients, but because you don't know what you're doing, you're actually doing more harm than you are helping. All right, the delays at the board. So pre-COVID, there was about a four to five month delay in getting a notice of hearing. As, as many of you are aware, the board shut down from March 16, 2020 to August 1st, 2020. So those few months that the board was, was shut down, the board accumulated about 80,000 applications. 90% of those applications were landlord applications, which created an extreme backlog. However, on August 1st, landlord applications were, were held, you know, via, the hearings were held via uh, video and uh, phone. However, due to the backlog, the current amount of wait time or in order to receive a notice of hearing is about nine to 12 months. So you're probably thinking, what's the alternative? Because if, it, if it'll take nine to 12 months to serve an N12 and wait for a hearing, if a tenant doesn't leave, what's the point in serving an N12? And you're right, which buyer is going to stick around? Because if you don't meet your closing date, the seller is going to have to pay a penalty for every month of a delay that they're not, that the seller is not able to provide vacant possession. This is why there's no guarantee to vacant possession. But here's the alternative. The alternative and option two, because option one was the N11, the, the uh, N12. Option two is what I call cash for keys. Cash for keys is exactly what I call it. And many of you have heard the term, uh, some think it's extortion. I think it's getting control of your property back. Uh, you know, it is what it is, right? Cash for keys is exactly what I call it. It's offering something of value in order to entice that tenant to move out. It can be cash. It can be a forgiveness of rent arrears. It can be whatever, paying moving costs, uh, giving them a week away to Blue Mountain, whatever, something uh, to get them to agree to end the tenancy. A cash for keys is not a DIY. Guys, please, please don't get involved with cash for keys. You know, if you think you don't know what you're doing on an N12, a cash for keys is gonna set your, you set your closing date well behind. A cash for keys has to be facilitated by a legal representative who's well-versed with not only cash for keys, the Residential Tenancies Act. The legal rep will facilitate, facilitate a termination of tenancy and negotiate terms directly with that tenant. A consent agreement along with the N11, N11 agreement to end the tenancy will be drafted. Now, let's talk about the N11 because I call the N11 the incredible hulk of the landlord and tenant board agreements because it's exactly what it is. It's, it's such a powerful agreement that once all parties sign, they're basically giving up their rights to the lease, the tenancy. Once those documents are signed, we file them with the board right away and we request an ex parte order, which is basically a fancy legal term for an order without a hearing. In order to evict the tenant, if they don't move out by the termination date, all without having to wait nine months to get a hearing date. The cash for keys is meant to be quick. 
because again, they're getting, you know, we're paying them to leave pretty much. Uh, the timing in order to receive an order from the board is about 60 to 90 days. If the tenant moves before that, which is the goal, it's great. But the reason why the, the, the documents should be filed with the board anyways is for an official termination of tenancy. And the legal rep will, again, arrange for the keys to be picked up. I have a, a cheat sheet that I'm going to be putting into the chat as well as sending it over to Gary to send it out to everyone. And you can refer back to this uh, basically to see how a cash for keys works. Again, guys, don't get involved with this. It's very important that you stay away from any legal documents. So we are almost at the end of the presentation. Uh, this is uh, uh, my landlord mastery guide. I never charge anything for my giveaways. This is something Rob and I came up with uh, and it's free to download. Head over to landlordmastery.ca uh, to download. It gives you access to our Google Drive, which is updated regularly. It is equipped with other agreements such as a parking agreement, an air conditioning agreement, scripts, forms, uh, quali qualifying questions to ask a tenant prospect so you don't have to get into your car and go and show property to tire kickers. It's a great guide. We still, we still refer back to it for our own rental properties. So I'm sharing it with you guys. I'll send a copy to Gary as well today. And here we are at the end of the presentation. I know it's an overwhelming amount of information. So Gary, do you want to do a Q and A? Absolutely. Thanks for that. <clears throat> Cash for keys is really, really powerful on many, many levels. Uh, wouldn't you agree, Bitta? And uh, this, it's a great opportunity also to, you know, provide that win-win solution as well. And, you know, we're never looking to take advantage of anybody. We're looking to provide the win-win solutions. So yeah, raise your hand or put the, your question please into the chat, or we're happy to, you know, bring you on camera. We'd much rather see your smiling faces. <laughs> and I'm sure there are uh, a number of questions. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take them as they come. Absolutely. I have a quick question. It's Kelly Piccolo. Go ahead, Hi, Kelly. Kelly. Hi. Um, so I actually just sold uh, a tenanted property and my landlord's getting ready to serve the N12. And I was going to ask you actually on timing. I consulted a lawyer, but I think I might have them contact you guys. Um, their tenancy is month to month and it renews on the 15th of the month every month. So the lawyer that I spoke to is not uh, well versed in Landlord Tenant Act. She just thought that I would have to serve it now by June 14th and give them 60 days by that date. So usually lawyers are, are not well-versed with the, the Residential Tenancies Act. Uh, they usually don't practice in the lower courts. It's not really worth it for them to do that. Uh, again, paralegals, and not all paralegals uh, do uh, landlord and tenancy matters. You wanna make sure that you know, your client is well protected. So definitely have them give us a call. I will do my best to help as much as I can. Okay, perfect. Perfect. I see Matt, you had your hand up there. Go ahead, Matt. I did indeed. Hey, yeah. Uh, thanks for that, Vita. Hey, Gary. Um, Hi, Matt. I, I uh, logged in a few minutes late. So forgive me if you've already talked about this, but um, what about showing? So I, I recently sold a property where the tenant didn't allow any showings, um, period. So we went even as far as like 15 minutes showings only like three hours a week. He said, no. What are the options there? So a tenant cannot uh, restrict showings. They cannot uh, deny entry. A landlord is by law, section 27 of the act, a landlord has the right to enter with 24 hour notice for the purpose of showings uh, with a realtor. So you're allowed to, to do that. The, the thing is, Matt, is that by the time the landlord issues a notice, goes through the motions, waits nine to 12 months for a hearing date in order to get an order for compliance, They've missed that market. So I always recommend if you have a challenging tenant and there's 99% there's of the tenants are challenging now because of COVID, you, the, the, the more creative way to get them out is cash for keys. The landlord is going to have to consider it because it's almost like the tenant is holding the property hostage. So best to you know give them a few bucks or get them out, 
give the property a facelift, a cleaning, a painting, that way access and timing is not restricted. There's really, I mean, unless you're, you're, the seller wants to go through the motions of going through the board, waiting for a hearing, you know, who knows when that'll be, they're, they're going to miss the market. And they did, but thank and you. They did. And they did. So it may be the, it may be a good business decision to consider cash for keys because anytime you own rental properties and you operating them for the purpose of rental income, you own a business. You have to think of it as a business. And, you know, as a business owner, is it a smart decision to, to give 5,000 to the tenant and give them 30, 30 days to leave so that I can sell the property now? I'm going to recover that money tenfold uh, on the sale. So again, that may be something for the client to consider, strongly consider. Right. Okay. Thank so you for that. A few more questions coming in here. Alicia, I see your hand up. Christine, I see your hand up. Uh, Jane post posted a question a little while ago in the comments there, Bitta. Uh, in the case of the woman whose daughter was in Ottawa and the, her plans changed, what should the landlord have done to get her condo listed and not risking that bad faith, for instance? So Jane, great question. Uh, unfortunately, there was nothing that the landlord could have done in order to prevent this unless the landlord moved in herself, which she couldn't. So again, you have to make sure that whoever's moving in is a thousand percent committed because no excuse will fly with the board. Very good. Okay. Alicia, you, you got your question ready? Hi. Yeah. Uh, it's Alicia Grimshaw. I, so I have, I'm selling a rental unit right now. It's a triplex. Um, one of the tenants has stopped paying since COVID, um, basically on the, the basis of, um, you know, putting food in the fridge for kids or paying rent. So it's understandable. Um, but my clients want to sell the, the, um, building and in terms of that cash for keys, um, like they, I don't think they put in a motion yet with the board to, uh, get past due a uh, rental. Um, I'm wondering, number one, is that if that's going to be excused because of COVID and number two, if the cash for keys, they could maybe, maybe say to him like, Oh, I'm going to offer you this. And I will also relieve you of what you owe me. If not, this is what's going to happen. Um, is that the best way to go? That's my first question. I have one more quick one after that. So they can, so they they can, can pursue an application, pursue an application, application of rent as long as they serve that notice while the tenant is in possession. The board is not going to provide a forgiveness because of COVID. The, otherwise, millions of tenants would have been given a forgiveness. There is no such thing as a, uh, unless the landlord agrees to a forgiveness, the board will not the board doesn't own the property. They're not in the position to provide forgiveness on somebody else's property. If the landlord wants to use a forgiveness of the rent, Alicia, as leverage or as the strategy, it's a great strategy. But if the tenant doesn't have money to pay the rent, how are they going to have money to put a first and last somewhere else? Very good. Okay. Awesome. Uh, Christine, you had, you had your hand up. I did. I have a question. Um, suppose the landlord who is also the seller sells a house with a tenant inside and the purchaser assumes the tenant and they tell you in good faith that they're going to assume the tenant, but they want you to file on their behalf an N12 because the buyer or the buyer's family wants to occupy the home. What's the liability issue for the seller after that? So the seller is the one who serves the N12 because- On the, behalf of the buyer, right? You got it. And the seller opens himself to 12 months of liability from the date that the tenant moves out. If the purchaser or the purchaser's family member or whoever was supposed to move in doesn't move in. The seller is the one that is liable. Now, more and more, we're seeing the applications that are, are that you know are being uh, thrown on my desk are the the tenants, the former tenants are now holding not only the seller liable, but they're also holding the new purchaser liable, the realtors liable. They're all they're listing all parties on the application, but the the seller holds themselves liable for twelve months 
from the date that the tenant moves out. Is the there any clause out. that we can put in there um, to indemnify the seller to the buyer in terms of let it go down the, the proper channels? No. Okay. No. That's a great question, Christine. Um, yeah, it is a great yeah, question. Yeah, we've had it in the past where I was a listing agent, property sold conditionally, went firm, and then maybe in your case too, two, three, four weeks later, the buyer comes and says, hey, we want the N12 served. And I put my foot down. I said, you know, that was not negotiated on the purchase and sale agreement. We're not going to be moving forward with that N12. So that might be a way to protect your seller that way as well. I, you, you, it's not making great friends with a buyer's agent. But at the end of the day, we're not supposed to. We're supposed to be protecting our sellers, right? Or our clients. Yeah. That's right. And and this is where the beauty of cash for keys is, is because you can do whatever you want afterwards. The seller can do whatever they want. Sell it, re-rent it. Gary can move in. <laughs> Whoever wants to move in, they can move in. You're not limited with the N11. You're True. Limited most, with the sellers, N12. most sellers find that kind of extortion and they'd rather call hell's angels than give them money, you know? Well, oh. hell, <laughs> hell's, in, hell's angels is, is going to get them in more trouble. But I mean, <laughs> remember, it's a business like and, I, and I'm very hard on my landlords, like 99.9% .9 of our business is landlord based. And, and I'm really hard on them because it is a business. Do not treat this as it's just additional income. No, it is a business. It is the most highly regulated business in all of Ontario right? It's highly regulated. You cannot, there are no loopholes, right? You can get a tenant out in accordance to working within the law. But the second you step out and you decide to, you know, call hell's angels or, you know, it's extortion, then, you know, it's, it, you're making a decision based on your emotions and you're going to miss the market. This is what I tell my sellers. If, what are your options? You're going to wait nine months and miss the market. You're going to miss out on, on two or $300,000 give them five grand, get them out, do what you have to do and make your money. That is a smart businessman. Beautiful. Any other questions? There's a couple, couple in the chat there and uh, Najim has a, a question based on uh, non-payment by, by the tenant, obviously. Is there a time frame when you can evict a tenant for not paying? If they haven't paid for two months, three months, do we have to give them a 30 or 60 day notice? Another great question. Why, why don't you take that one, Bitta? So great question, Najim. Actually, this is a whole different presentation that I'd love to come back on. But let me start off by saying rent is due on or before the first or whatever date that you agree. If rent is not paid on the day that it's due, the day after the landlord should serve an N4 notice for non-payment of rent. This notice, it tells the tenant you have three options. Option number one, you pay all of the arrears in full within 14 days. Option number two, move out in 14 days. And option number three, do nothing. And if you do nothing, then the landlord on day 15 can pursue an application through the board for an eviction. But again, in order to pursue an application for an eviction, you're, you're, you're going through the channels of the board, waiting nine months for a hearing. The tenant can raise other issues or is, issues and concerns under now what we call a section 82, which means uh, the reasons or to justify why they haven't paid the rent. And then the board will make a decision. On top of that, tenants can void the, the order from the board in four ways, okay? Four, four chances they have. Number one, they can pay in full within the 14 days. Number two, they can pay in full before the hearing. Number three, they can pay on the day of the hearing. And number four, they can pay before the arrival of the sheriff. So they have four chances to void the eviction order. I hope that answers your question, but I'd love to come back for that presentation. Uh, that, that's good insight. And <clears throat> excuse me, our property manager for uh, three of our buildings, and in total, that's 14 units uh, for those particular three buildings. On the, on the second of every month, they're, they're submitting. It's the N4, right, uh, Bitta? Got yeah, it. They are submitting that N4 because we want a track record of, of what's happening. Even though they pay maybe on the third or the fourth, we want to make sure there's that track record. Yeah. And now you have to be careful, uh, Gary, because we, the law society just had their annual general annual general meeting that now says that property managers and realtors are not allowed to serve and force. 
So it, 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 it'll invalidate it. So just be careful when your property manager is issuing that because I mean, I know property managers and realtors, we do it to help our clients. But again, it, it's when it goes through the channels of the board and it ends up on the adjudicator's desk on the day of the hearing, you don't want to risk having that hearing dismissed, right? Absolutely. Some of, and you kind of mentioned this right off the top. Uh, some of the best education I ever got was was going to the tribunals. Yes. And I know we can't quite do that physically at the moment, but let me urge you, if, if real estate investing is something you want to dive into and you really want to get yourselves educated, uh, spend a morning there because I learned more in that morning of what not to do, just as you explained. <laughs> Uh, and, and how well prepared I felt I was, uh, by the time I had the opportunity to go up in front of the adjudicator. Um, but, but that, that's always, I always found that amazing. And from the comical side of it, Vita, you, sometimes you can't buy entertainment like that. Oh yes. Oh yes. That's, that's one thing I miss about the board. Well, two things. One was learning <laughs> and two is the entertainment. Yeah. Uh, we, I mean, you can join online. Uh, if, if you want, I can send you some links uh, to hearings that I have and you can join and just sit there as, as an observer and just listen because, you know, sometimes these tenant advocate groups come on the hearings and they hold the hearings hostage and the, the matters have to get adjourned. It's yeah, it's like that, but online. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. Uh, any more questions for the audience? I see a couple of questions in the chat, so I'll, I'll go back to that. And, um, okay. So a follow up from Kelly. Uh, so if a property is now sold firm, should a landlord attempt an N 12 first, or just go straight to the cash for keys with uh, legal counsel? So Kelly, I recommend that your client gets, uh, obtains independent legal advice for that. And that way they can, that way, their details can be disclosed to the legal rep and then the legal rep can either, you know, recommend the N12 or the cash for keys. Very good. Very good. And next question from Hermila, a client asked me if you can increase the rent on an all inclusive because of the cost increases. So no, mm -hmm. no, you can't increase the rent uh, because of the cost increases. So you can increase rent annually per the guideline, per the guidelines set by the ministry. In 2021, right now, there is a rent freeze, okay? Uh, so you can't increase the rent. If you're going to increase the rent because of capital expenditures, you're going to have to bring an application to the board and have the over and above the guideline increase approved by the board. But if you're painting and if you change the roof, these are, these are aesthetics. Very good. Very good. Any other questions while we, for, for Bitta while we have her? Again, I'm going to send a copy of uh, the presentation slides and the cheat sheet to Gary. I put a copy in the chat for you guys to download, but I'll, I'll send another copy to Gary and you can send it out to everybody to use as a reference. Yeah, that's amazing. I I'll, I'll be honest with you. I've used the cash for keys. Uh, for a non-paying tenants. So this was years ago and I don't mind sharing the story. Um, we, when, when you have ten or when you have tenants, you're going to ha have some amazing ones. And then the, just the nature of the numbers and the game, sometimes you don't. Right. And I had a tenant that was not paying for about six months and there was, I knew there was no chance of me getting that money back. And I basically said to him, here's, here's your last month's rent and I had it in cash. I said, if you have everything in your truck by tonight at five o'clock, uh, there's the cash. So it's funny what, what motivates people. Right. And it, it works. It works. I had an empty unit that, that night and it, it does work in different circumstances. Now, and fast forward, that was about seven or eight years ago. The last time I, I actually physically did it, uh, times have changed. So that would cost a lot more. <laughs> However, <laughs> as Bitta has also said, uh, that short-term pain, uh, there's a lot, a lot, that long-term gain there. I'd much rather sell a vacant property or a property that I can control in a sense, uh, do some updates to like painting. Cause just about every tenant, you know, they leave the house a little bit differently than what you and I would like. 
and it's always good to update that property, everything from paint to, to what have you. So that, that would be my preference too. Absolutely. Yeah. Get them out, get them out, do what you have to do to get more money. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Very good. Very good. Well, if there's no other questions. Uh, I want to extend a huge thank you to Bitta, and thank you for, for coming online with us this afternoon. Thank you for the resources. And I know that uh, people have been asking for your contact details. So I don't know if you wanted to throw that into the chat yeah, there. Let's or, throw that in the chat I here. I should have mentioned that earlier. <laughs> <laughs> no worry. Just, just like we talk to our clients and providing them with the right insight and, and uh, everything from who's, who's the painter or contractor that we're using, uh, reference great paralegals like bits of, so we can, they can, you know, feel like they're getting uh, the right service, the right protection and the right information because the wrong one wrong move can set forth a domino effect of not having that tenant move out for years. Trust me. Uh, um, years. So having, having somebody in our back pocket, like bit is going to be fantastic for us moving forward. Very good. Yeah. There's, there's the, um, contact info. So go grab that. I'll start. I'll certainly make sure everyone gets a copy of the presentation and, uh, thank you again. And again, you, you handle all matters tenant related, correct? Oh, that's all I do. I don't do five or six different types of, we don't do, Rob is saying we, we, uh, we don't do five or six different types of laws. This is the only law that we know because of our real estate background. So this is our area of expertise or specialty. Fantastic. So there you go. Uh, if you're watching, reach out to Bitta and her team. They will certainly take great care of you and your clients. All the best to everybody and have an amazing afternoon. Bye for now. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Bye everyone.